And just like that, we meet again. Hello, beautiful people. How are you? How are you going? How is your week going? I trust all you beautiful people are here from the first video in this series. So to do just a very short, condensed version of my usual intro. Hi, I'm Liz. I sit in this chair a lot and talk to you guys about all kinds of things. So please subscribe and we can be best friends forever. I, of course, also have Lily Girl here and all of her fabulousness to give us some emotional support. Editing Liz, let's switch to Lily Cam. Don't you wish I could be that efficient in just all of my videos? If you haven't seen the first video in this series, I don't want to tell you how to live your life, but you should probably pause this video and click here to watch it. And I'll just wait here until you're all caught up and ready to start part two. I also wanted to tell you guys that because these videos are really long and there's like a lot of information just being, you know, blasted at you, I have included timestamps in the description down below. So if you're after something specific or I'm just going on and on about something you're genuinely not interested in, feel absolutely free to just skip right on through. With that said, are you guys ready to continue our journey? Previously on Welcome to Nexium. Just to refresh your memories, in part one we talked about Keith Rennie's childhood, his early adulthood where he just committed some truly reprehensible and despicable acts. Also we explored the beginnings of executive success programs and Tony Natale's harrowing past with Keith. And I mentioned in the previous video that while Tony's experience was just truly horrific and traumatic, she was actually one of the fortunate ones because she managed to get away with her life. Tragically, Gina Hutchinson was not one of the fortunate ones. Gina Hutchinson was, of course, the 15-year-old schoolgirl that 24-year-old Keith justified having sex with because, according to him, her soul was much older than her biological age and that she was, in fact, a Buddhist goddess, just destined to be with him. Keith managed to convince Gina to drop out of school to be tutored by him. The Hutchinson family, who were strict Mormons, didn't really fight this. They were under the impression that the two would sooner or later get married, but this was never going to be the case. Although it's unclear how long their sexual relationship lasted, Gina continued at least a very close friendship with Keith for many years, eventually working at CBI with him. Gina had always had a really keen interest in religion and philosophy, and she ended up deciding to study religion and anthropology at the University of Albany. While there, she bonded with some of her male professors who mentored her in her study, and Keith did not like this one little bit. I mean, the nerve, right? Why should Gina need anyone but the world's smartest man to mentor her? Gina eventually had enough of Keith's irrational jealousy and tried her best to break away from him. But Keith and his inner circle of loyal followers would harass her, calling her constantly, telling her she needed to come back. And I've mentioned this inner circle before, but not gone into great detail, mostly because it makes me feel a bit icky, like I want to throw up in my mouth a little bit every time I go to talk about it. Basically, Keith lived in his townhouse with a handful of women in a dormitory style setting. And these women lived and breathed for Keith. They devoted their lives to him, cooking and cleaning for him, emotionally supporting and financially supporting him, and more notably, fulfilling his sexual needs. And while Keith was having sex with all of these women plus more, they were all voluntarily monogamous to only him. I mean, I can't be the only one that feels icky about this. Another thing these women did for Keith was his dirty work, like harassing those that left ESP. For instance, Gina Hutchinson. So these women were calling Gina constantly, showing up on her doorstep. I'm pretty sure one of them even told her that Keith might die if Gina didn't come back because they were just so closely connected, like enmeshed, you know? Gina eventually gave in and in 2002, she took part in an ESP intensive course, which was like a normal course, but more intense. And it was during this course that Gina accused Keith of statutory rape in her teens. Now, around this time, ESP was doing really well, but it needed money to grow, and Keith was well aware of this. As a result, some of Keith's favorite people to recruit were the children of important people, be it politicians, celebrities, successful entrepreneurs. And he would do this under the guise of helping these people step out of their parents' shadow. But in reality, Keith was just after that family's wealth 
fame and power. Among these recruits were Emiliano Salinas, the son of the former Mexican president Carlos Salinas. There was also, and I hope I say this correctly, Rosa Lorenco, whose family owned one of the largest newspaper groups in Mexico. India Oxenberg, who was daughter to Catherine Oxenberg of dynasty fame and granddaughter to Princess Elizabeth of Yugoslavia. But the most lucrative recruits that Keith had set his eyes on were Claire and Sarah Bronfman, heiresses to the Seagram's liquor empire. Around the time that Gina went public with her accusations, the sisters had done a couple of ESP courses and were really keen to work more closely with the company. Scrooge McDuck style, Keith was seeing dollar signs. Claire and Sarah were the daughters of Edgar Bronfman Sr., the chairman of Seagram's. Their family had once owned Universal Studios. Their brother, Edgar Bronfman Jr., was the CEO of Warner Music. So the Bronfman sisters and their trust funds were going to be huge assets for ESP. And Gina Hutchinson was going to ruin all of this with her claims of rape. If the sisters caught wind of Keith's history of sexually abusing underage girls and children, shit was going to hit the fan fast. And ESP ESP was going to lose out on a whole lot of money. Okay, now, so I don't want to make any accusations here or have anyone say I'm jumping to conclusions, but just keep this dilemma that Keith was facing in the very forefront of your mind for just a moment, okay? On the 11th of October 2002, Gina's body was found outside a Buddhist monastery in Woodstock, New York. She was just 33 years old and she had died from a gunshot wound to the head from a 20 gauge pump action shotgun. Her death was ruled a suicide and as a result there were very little ballistics carried out. In fact police didn't even complete a gun residue test. Ballistics expert Cynthia Burr has said that this was a very peculiar case of suicide, that a woman using a shotgun to kill herself is a very uncommon occurrence. Gina's sister Heidi is also very skeptical and doesn't believe that Gina, who she knew to be such a loving, gentle person, would have killed herself no matter what the circumstances are, let alone in such a violent way. But I mean, like I said, I'm not making any accusations here. I'm just pointing out some very convenient timing for Keith because Claire and Sarah Bronfman never ended up hearing of Gina's accusations and the sisters and more importantly their fortune ended up being very heavily involved in ESP and Nexium. No one knows the exact amount that Claire and Sarah poured into Nexium from their trust funds, but estimates put it anywhere between 66 million and 200 million. And that brings us to the creation of Nexium itself. With access to pretty much bottomless piles of money, Keith decided he wanted to create more companies with more specialized courses and classes and curriculum. And we'll talk about these in a little while. But basically, Nexium was created as an umbrella company for all of these sub companies. Nexium's slogan was working towards a better world. And at its peak, it had roughly 700 to 800 members. It took the form of an MLM and you could technically make money through Nexium, but the only way to do this was to make your way up the stripe path. So what's the stripe path? So remember those funny silk scarves I mentioned in the first video? They were to show what rank a Nexium member was and where they were on the stripe path. The lowest rank was a beginner or a student and they wore a white scarf after they paid their $2,000 entry fee, of course. Keith, despite having the honorable title of Vanguard and being the figurehead of the company, wore a white scarf because he called himself a student of life. From white, you could progress up through yellow, orange, green, blue, purple, and gold. There was only one person that made it to gold though, and that of course was Nancy Salzman, and her title was Prefect. The only way to ascend through the ranks was to put thousands and thousands of dollars into Nexium courses, take part in countless EMs, recruit more members, and on top of all this, hours and hours of unpaid work. A lot of the time to pay off the debt you had accumulated from the expensive courses. Or you could just be an attractive, slender woman 
form in that court case I. In these cases, a lot of the time the fees would be mysteriously waived and progression through the ranks would be a lot more snappy because progression and promotion always came down to Keith's personal discretion. You could only start earning money in Nexium once you reach the role of proctor, signified by an orange scarf if you're wondering. And this was a big deal, a huge achievement. By this point, you had likely put in over half a million dollars and countless hours of your life into Nexium. So imagine how disheartening it must have been to finally reach that coveted role of proctor and finally have the chance to make some of your money back and instead discover that you were just under more pressure to work for free. A woman named Bonnie Peace, who was a proctor for Nexium, said that at one point she was literally working 20 hour days, waking up at 5am, doing EMs, coaching students, recruiting new members all day and late into the night with no breaks, eating her meals on the go, just go, 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 go. And the feedback she received from her superior after all of this back breaking, soul destroying work, why aren't you doing more? Why aren't you giving more? It just feels like you're not committed to the cause. So essentially, if you were working for Nexium, you were working on an empty tank, maybe even adrenaline in some cases. And if you were to ever ask for rest, you would be told that you didn't need as much rest as you thought you did. I mean, Vanguard only needed two to four hours sleep a night, plus up to eight hours during the day, but they would conveniently leave this part out. You'd be told that all rest did was feed your comfort addiction, that you should be uncomfortable, you should be struggling, That's how you grow. If you're struggling to empathize with some of the people that fell victim to Nexium, that's okay. To be honest, I struggled as well to begin with. And we're only human. Most likely humans that have had a full night's rest and only worked a measly 8 to 12 hour day, but human all the same. But I do hope that it's starting to make a bit more sense to you how someone could become so indoctrinated and brainwashed living in the conditions that these people were. I mean, yes, they were full-grown adults, but they were overworked, overwhelmed, sleep-deprived adults. A dangerous combination created by a system deliberately designed by Keith Raniere to rob these people blind of their ability to make sound decisions. And that's not even taking into account the fact that from the second these people had stepped foot into ESP centers, they had been hammered with messages telling them not to trust their instincts or themselves. Messages that said if they had an issue with Nexium and how it was run, that was actually their issue issue that they were projecting onto Nexium and that they needed to question themselves and why they felt that way rather than questioning the issue itself. And if this didn't work and they still spoke up and asked questions, their concerns would be dismissed and they'd be told to have an EM so that they didn't feel that way anymore. Plus there was the very real threat held over their heads that if they asked too many questions, they would be labeled a suppressive. There's a very similar term used in Scientology, a suppressive person or an SP, and the concepts are basically the same. A suppressive was someone who had such low self-esteem that when they saw something good and pure and beautiful, their instinct was to destroy or suppress it. Espians were told that everyone had suppressive tendencies. That was just part of being human. But if someone was a true suppressive, they truly harbored bad evil intentions. So with this concept, questioning Nexium and its practices were made synonymous with having evil intentions, something no Espion wanted. And as a result, Nexium and by default Keith Raniere were truly above question. In November 2002, a woman named Kristen Snyder took part in a $7,000 16-day ESP intensive course held in Anchorage, Alaska. By this point in time, ESP had sent its tendrils out of Albany, taking hold with centers in places like Los Angeles, Seattle, 
Anchorage and several centers in Mexico. Kristen was 35 years old, lived with her wife Heidi Clifford and worked as an environmental consultant. She was described as someone that was level-headed and never moody, a valued and respected member of her community who, according to all of her family and friends, had never in the past experienced issues with her mental or emotional health. Kristen had always been an overachiever and she was sold on the idea that ESP would help her progress in her career and enhance her personal life. In January 2003, after that initial ESP intensive course she attended, Kristen traveled to Albany to meet Keith Ranieri and it was later revealed that during this several day visit, Keith privately mentored Kristen. Allegedly, Keith was very excited about this opportunity to mentor Kristen because it gave him the chance to find out if his private mentoring could convert a gay woman to heterosexuality. And I trust you guys are picking up what I'm putting down with all these quotes around mentoring. Her family says that when she returned home from Albany, Kristen was just a different person. She was increasingly withdrawn, she was depressed, and she was sleep deprived. She told her wife Heidi that Vanguard didn't need sleep, so I don't need sleep either. Kristen was obviously upset, but swore Keith was a great man. Anytime someone tried to talk to her about what had happened in Albany, she would cut the conversation off and go and call her ESP coach. Her mother said that Kristen became delusional during this time, claiming that she was responsible for the Columbia shuttle disaster, a fatal incident that occurred on the 1st of February 2003 when the space shuttle Columbia disintegrated upon re-entering Earth's atmosphere, killing all seven astronauts on board. Despite or maybe because of the serious concerns she had over this Keith Ranieri guy, Heidi agreed to join Kristen on another ESP intensive course being held in Anchorage in February. And on the 10th day of this intensive course, Kristen was physically removed from the classroom, screaming and crying while the instructor told the other students to ignore her, that she was just doing this for attention. Earlier in the class, Kristen had become increasingly distressed, expressing suicidal thoughts and claiming multiple times that she was pregnant with Keith's baby. Heidi asked the instructor if she could take Kristen to the hospital, but the instructor just told her again that there was no need because Kristen was just doing this for attention. So at about 4 p.m. on the 6th of February, 2003, Heidi watched her wife Kristen get into their 1999 Toyota truck and drive off. And that was the last time Kristen Snyder has ever been seen. Heidi called the police that evening when Kristen failed to come home. And two days later, her abandoned truck was found in Resurrection Bay, which was an hour and a half drive away from Anchorage. And on the passenger seat of the truck, they found a handwritten letter that both sends ice cold shivers down my spine and makes me want to cry because it's just so heartbreaking. The letter read, I attended a course called Executive Success Programs, aka Nexium, based out of Anchorage, Alaska and Albany, New York. I was brainwashed and my emotional center of the brain was killed slash turned off. I still have feelings in my external skin, but my internal organs are rotting. Please contact my parents if you find me or this note. I am sorry, life. I didn't know I was already dead. May we persist into the future. Next to this letter was another one that read, no need to search for my body. Despite this second note, there was an extensive two-day search for Kristen, including authorities, ski patrollers, members of the public, the Coast Guard, helicopters, but Kristen's body was never found. It was discovered, however, that a camping rental store near where Kristen's truck had been discovered had been broken into, and the only things that were missing was an old kayak and a pair of oars, and these were also never found. It was believed that Kristen had stolen the kayak and dragged it down to the water where she committed suicide by intentionally tipping it and drowning. Keith Ranieri, however, believed that Kristen was alive and told his followers that her death was all a big hoax, that she was living in Mexico. But despite him hiring his own private investigators to look into her disappearance, Keith never managed to find Kristen either. So honestly, it's all a big mystery. 
Did Kristen commit suicide like her presumed death certificate says? Did she run away to start a new life? Or did Keith Raniere have her kidnapped and or killed to shut her up? To this day, despite a lot of speculation, no one knows. So ESP had been running for six or seven years when Jeunesse began. And Jeunesse. Oh, Jeunesse. Jeunesse was a women's only group that focused on female empowerment, or at least it claimed to. It was supposed to teach women how their gender affected their role in society and in relationships. Jeunesse was started by Pam Kafritz, one of Keith's life partners, a member of his inner circle. And while it was promoted to be all about women empowering women, the curriculum was all written or co-written by Keith, and it was just crawling with misogynistic and archaic themes. The program was broken up into 11 eight-day workshops that cost $5,000 each. And in these workshops, women were taught really fun things like that they were naturally monogamous creatures that were designed to only be with one man. But men, on the other hand, were naturally polyamorous and needed to spread their seed. Yuck. Oh, so gross. Other super empowering teachings included that women were prone to cast themselves as victims, that they were flighty and impulsive, and less adept at understanding right versus wrong. Women were told that men all hated women because they were obnoxious and entitled and whiny, but that men had to put up with women because they held them prisoners with sex. And then there was Jeunesse Tracks, where men were allowed to join the workshops, and where again, women were told that men were just not meant to be monogamous and that they shouldn't question their partner if their partner chose to sleep with other women. But that, of course, it was absolutely imperative that they stay monogamous to their man. One of the Jeunesse Tracks workshops actually dealt with the topic of rape and Keith would blur the lines between rape and consent, saying, and I quote, Screaming abuse is abuse in itself. Women in this workshop were told that it was their fault if they were negatively impacted by an encounter that they perceived as rape, because that encounter only happened to their bodies, not to them. So what was the issue? And believe it or not, this is barely scratching the surface of some of the incredibly damaging and depraved things that Keith had to say about sexuality. Some of the footage of his talks that I came across where he talks about the sexual abuse of children and argued that it was a societal concept, I can't even repeat because it's sickening. Now, the male counterpart to Jeunesse was SOP or Society of Protectors. And this was a militant style group that claimed its intention was to build character and turn its members from little boys into men, mostly with a lot of macho yelling. There was also a lot of physical training in SOP in an apparent attempt by Keith to weaponize his most loyal followers to create an army, if you will. Part of the training was readiness drills where the person in command would send out a text at any random time of the day or night to their team saying ready. And if the entire team did not reply ready within 60 seconds, they would all need to take part in a penance. The penance varied. It could be that everyone had to have an ice cold shower or that they all had to get up at 4 a.m. and stand for 30 minutes. It could be standing barefoot in the snow. You get the idea. Now bear with me because I want to talk about the Stanford prison experiment before we talk about the next group because, well, you'll see. It's important though. Just trust me, okay? For those of you who have not heard of this experiment, it's pretty intense. I'll include a link down below with a more in-depth look into it. But to give you just a very brief overview, in 1971, a research group at Stanford University conducted a social experiment where the goal was to investigate the psychological effect of perceived power. So they created a mock prison and they assigned the role of either guard or prisoner to a bunch of volunteer students. And then they just let them be to see what would happen. Cute. 
right? The results were just horrific. The students that had been assigned the role of guards totally embraced it and treated the prisoners like garbage. According to the results, one third of them displayed genuinely sadistic tendencies during the experiment and some of the prisoners were subjected to just terrible psychological torture at the hands of these guys. The experiment was meant to last for two weeks but was called off after just six days when the girlfriend of the head researcher turned up and was just like, what the actual fuck? Anywho, Keith Raniere was fascinated by this experiment. He said that life itself in actuality was the Stanford prison experiment and that women were the guards and men were the prisoners. So he decided to reverse these roles when he created SOP Complete. In SOP Complete, the women of Nexium were invited to take part in SOP training with the men. And this is probably one of the most disturbing things I came across in my research. Keith told the men of SOP that women were princesses that had never had to have their pride broken in the way that little boys do, like in locker room scenarios or on the playing field. And that SOP Complete was a way for the men to help the women experience the humiliation and degradation that little boys did. While taking part in the training, women were not allowed to eat, drink or use the bathroom without asking for permission. And they also needed to sign an agreement saying that they would accept all feedback without talking back. If they did argue, then they would be forced to wear a mask or a tiara. Claire Bronfman was actually forced to wear a jock strap for arguing with one of the men. As a result, the women quickly fell into compliance, much like the prisoners in the Stanford prison experiment, because this was the safest way to make sure that they weren't singled out or humiliated or punished. SOP Complete was promoted to the men as a way to get their own back at women for all the pain they put them through with their nitpicking and their nagging and their crying. And this, of course, appealed to a lot of Nexium men with all of the toxic teachings going around. A lot of the men felt terrible about it, though, but if they spoke out or said they had an issue with the way the women were being treated, in true Nexium style, it would be turned back on them. They would be told, well, there must be something wrong with you you if you don't want to help these women by humiliating and shaming them. You should probably go get an EM to deal with that. A lot of the women who went through SOP Complete reported exiting the course, feeling extremely positive feelings towards the torturers. I mean the men. You know, like Stockholm Syndrome, where the captive develops empathy and affection for their captors. And there were so many other courses, guys, literally something for everyone. If Jeunesse or SOP didn't appeal to you, there was XOSO, which focused on fitness. There was the source where you could work on your public speaking and performance skills. If you were into singing, you could join the singing group, Simply Human. Oh, you have kids? Well, you could enroll them into Rainbow Cultural Garden, a daycare program where the kids were looked after by a different nanny every day that each spoke to them in different languages. Basically, Keith Raniere had his fingers in all of the pies. And then every summer, everyone in Nexium, who I remind you was already putting thousands of dollars into these courses and workshops we've spoken about, were encouraged to fork out an extra 20 grand on a corporate retreat in upstate New York called Vanguard Week. Vanguard Week, or V Week as it was commonly referred to as, was a week long celebration of Keith Ranieri's birthday. And it was essentially summer camp on steroids for adults. There were a ton of different activities you could take part in, including chess, martial arts, water sports, a triathlon, dancing, singing, plus, of course, the opportunity to just hang out with other Nexium members and bask in this perfect community they were creating. A huge draw card would also be that this would be a lot of people's first chance to meet Keith in the flesh, in real life. And they would all say just how surprised they were at how human and humble he was. The grand finale of V Week was V Day. Keith's birthday, where groups from different Nexium centers would perform tributes as birthday gifts for Keith in his honor. V Week was described as extremely overwhelming and exhausting, 
almost as though it was meant to break you down psychologically, probably because Keith had discovered that overworked, exhausted, overwhelmed people were compliant and obedient people, more susceptible to suggestion. In 2003, Forbes released an article about Keith and Nexium called The Cult of Personality. Keith had agreed to be interviewed by Forbes and give them an inside look at the company because he honestly thought it was going to be a positive article. The article was in fact scathing, calling to attention amongst other things Keith's failed business ventures, his vicious legal attacks on Tony Natale, and his self-serving teachings that were essentially filled with gibberish, accusing him of creating his own version of English to confuse and mislead his followers. The article then very humorously, in my opinion, went on to liken those teachings to horse manure. Wah, wah. Forbes also interviewed Edgar Bronfman Sr., Claire and Sarah Bronfman's father, who spoke to them about a $2 million loan that Claire had given Keith with a very generous interest rate of 2.5%. Edgar said that he hadn't spoken with his daughters in months and was growing increasingly concerned with the amount of hours and the emotional and financial investment that they were putting into Nexium, saying, and I quote, I think it's a cult, end quote. And may I remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that this article was released way back in 2003. Keith was absolutely flabbergasted when the article came out and it wasn't positive, but rather than admitting any wrongdoing on his part, he placed the blame squarely on Claire Bronfman's shoulders. He said that Forbes' profile of him and Nexium would have just been glowing if she hadn't stuffed up and told her father about the $2 million loan. And this was something that Claire would spend the next decade and more trying to make up for. You know, for someone who continually claimed there was no such thing as victims, you're surely picking up a pattern here where Keith Raniere would consistently portray himself as the ultimate victim. The Forbes article would not be the only negative press that Nexium received. In fact, most of the press they received was negative. But Keith was mostly unfazed, telling his followers that said that, you know, Nexium needed to work on their image, that he didn't want the weak-minded people that would fall for the lies that the media was peddling anyway. In our next and final video, we are going to talk about the very event that triggered the creation of DOS, the secret subgroup of sex slaves, an event that saw nine very high-ranking women from within Nexium leave the company. We're going to talk about DOS itself, of course, how actress Alison Mack got involved and the shady tactics that were used to recruit unsuspecting victims. And then finally, we are going to talk about the downfall of Nexium and Keith Raniere. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. If you've made it this far, you are truly a trooper. Please let me know your thoughts down in the comments if you're enjoying the series or if there's something you specifically want me to talk about in the last video, which will be out in the next week sometime. Lily, of course, would like to say goodbye. You're going to say bye? Did you like the video? Oh, what a nice cuddle. <laughs> Are you sucking up because you're hungry? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> You are sassy. All right, guys, time to wrap it up because if I don't go feed her this very second, she's going to keep beating up my plants. I hope you have just the most marvelous week of all time and I will see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>